Well, thanks very much, Jeff, and a big, huge thank you to the Mises Institute, Blue Rockwell, uh, and everyone from Mises for coming back down here to Ron Paul country. I gave a talk on the steps of the courthouse up in Angleton a few weeks ago, and I said, we always consider Brazoria County Ron Paul country because he always got uh, Kim Jong-un level <laughs> voting when he ran here. So, <laughs> so you're among friends. <laughs> So I was sitting in the studio with Dr. Paul the other day. We had just finished doing the show, and we, as we often do, we were kind of talking back and forth. And, and he said, we, and then the, the issue of, the, of this conference came up. And he looked around, and he said, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And I said, oh, yeah, I know. I said, Jeff asked me to talk about the Ron Paul Doctrine. And there was a silence, and he said, well, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's a joke. Some of you may have heard it, but um, how are anti-vaxxers and pro-vaxxers alike? Neither of them will ever be fully vaxxed. <laughs> you know, Jeff is right when we met here. How many of you were here last year at this place? Oh, lots of you. It felt, I, I mean, you're probably right with dissident. I was thinking speakeasy, you know. You had a special knock on the door and they would open the thing and yeah, you're okay to come in. It really had that feeling. It felt like we were really doing something uh, wrong. And I guess we were because we were spreading the message of liberty and freedom. But, you know, when we met a year ago, a year ago we had just lived through probably at least for many of us, the worst year of our lives, things were happening that we thought could not happen. Uh, they can't do this. They can't shut the churches down. They can't close my business. They can't force me to put something on my face I don't want. They can't push me around like this. Show us the law. And what happened is we saw the awakening of the deep fantasies of every petty bureaucrat in the country from dog catcher up to governor and now up to president. Their fantasies were unleashed by this virus and they dug in. And in a way that shows you how thin uh, our layer of rule of law is, how thin is our layer of basic humanity to other people, how thin is our layer of just critical thinking and reasoning. And that was the scariest thing, at least for me, to see how easily it could slip away in the hands of a few tyrants, a few very, very dumb but evil tyrants. And there, of course, are many uh, are many comparisons made to Germany in 33, and it become cliche, but it's still apropos. How did it happen that an enormously advanced and civilized society in the middle of Europe turned to an absolute murderous thugocracy where people gleefully and willfully, willingly turned in a class of people because they were considered dirty, they were considered diseased, you know, the first health passes were in Nazi Germany because the Nazi propaganda, the Nazi lies told the German people that the Jews were passing disease around and they needed to have for everyone's safety to be quarantined. And of course, you can take it too far. The boxcars are not outside yet, but it all starts with an evil thought, an evil thought and it all starts with a sense of evil in the heart. So that's where we are now. Just a year ago, we met here. Now, Biden had just stolen the election. I mean, um, had, just, <laughs> had just been elected the most popular president in history. <laughs> How's that working out? <laughs> and that year, a year of lockdowns at the time had done nothing to stop the virus. We watched it, Dr. Paul and I, every day on the Liberty Report. We tried to put up charge. We tried to say, look, here's what they did here, and it's done nothing. We talked a lot about Alex Berenson, who of course was banned from Twitter for life for saying a few months ago, this is a New York Times, I think he's a Pulitzer Prize award winning uh, journalist. A few months ago, he said, the vaccines are not preventing the transmission and infection. He was banned for life from Twitter for saying that. And he also said that they lose their efficacy over time. And guess what? So this is where we were a year ago we were watching all this happening, and we were probably all feeling the same thing, and certainly we all feel it now. This is a tyranny that's built on a mountain of lies. And lies, I guess, is the theme, the main theme of what I want to say today. A mountain of lies, this whole thing was built on. Masks, they did nothing to stop the spread of the virus. 
And Dr. Paul and I showed day after day, week after week, the different charts. And, and Tom Woods was here last year with the, about 8,000 charts for which he <laughs> almost ended up in Guantanamo <laughs> for showing them. But, you know, here is country X. Here is where they put in a mask mandate. And here are COVID cases. You know, and of course, just a few months ago, right, Death Santis wanted to kill everyone in Florida just because he thought it would be cool, right? Because he wouldn't put in the mask mandate. And all of a sudden, when Oregon, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, a lot of the blue states that are up in that northern area where there's a seasonal virus happening, when those shot up, no one said, oh, the governor of Oregon just wants to kill people. So this is where you have the politicization. Social distancing did nothing, as we know. And as we know now from Scott Gottlieb, who, this will shock you, was the FDA director, and then he turned to Pfizer board member, as they all do, right? But he actually in, he inadvertently told the truth. Maybe he he's, has a good sense of, for survival. But he, he was talking a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, many of you have heard it, about social distancing. And he was in the meeting in the White House, uh, and they were talking about, I think Jared was there and whoever, and someone brought up, well, Probably let's do 10 feet. Let's, let's, let's call it 10, because it had never been done before. It was created out of wool cloth. Let's do 10 feet. And then someone said, you know, that is going to be too difficult. It's going to be too unwieldy. Let's compromise and do six feet. And so that's the science that guided social distancing. Scott Atlas, you know, he's recently come out with a book, and I haven't, I haven't read it yet, but I've seen a couple of interviews. I'm reading RFK Jr.'s book right now. But Atlas was talking, giving some insider views of what it was like inside the coronavirus task force in the White House under Trump. And what, what struck me, and I guess it really shouldn't strike me, what struck me that he said that there was an absolute absence of intellectual curiosity in these meetings. There was no, okay, let's, let's, let's hear some charts here. Here's what we know, here's what we don't. It was all predetermined. They already knew they were going to go for maximum turn up the screws. And there was no, they, they didn't want to hear anything. So Atlas found himself a person of pretty serious credentials, completely on the outs. It's almost as if they had been planning for this their entire lives. Um, and they did not want to allow anything to get in their way. So then after we met last year, since we've met, I guess around the time we met, the shots came. The shots came. The U.S. government, first of all, uh, removed all liability for these products from the companies that manufactured them. So you can't do anything. And then they bought billions in doses of them, however many billions of doses uh, they had. The trials, as we all know, were a joke, and I'm not a scientist. But I do know that when you kill the control group, it's not a good way to follow people, you know, months and years on. They did a quickie, they did a quickie test, and then they gave everyone in the control group the, the virus, I mean, the, the shots, the, the so-called vaccine. Of course, we know it's not a vaccine, and this is not anything controversial. It's a new technology to reprogram your body to go after a specific part of the virus, a spike protein. We don't need to get into the details, but you know what I'm talking about. It's not a vaccine in the sense that we know there's an attenuated virus that you get and it provides protection. Uh, so we know none of this is, uh, is what they say, is what they claim, and you think, well, what can go wrong? Well, a lot can go wrong. What we've seen in this past year, and we, we've known it before, but big pharma in bed with government so, so, so completely, when you see the revolving door between government uh, employee, government servant, and big pharma executive, it's shocking, and there are plenty of charts of that. But billions of dollars were at stake, and billions of dollars have changed hands, mostly from working Americans and middle-class Americans into the pockets of the very, very rich and well-connected. I'm sure many of you, if not all, know about Moderna. They never brought a product to market before their, vac their vaccine. Uh, they were literally on the edge of bankruptcy when they brought their vaccine to market. And here they've got a product, no matter how many people it hurts or kills, hey, it's no big deal, it's no problem. That's probably why the head of Pfizer, which, by the way, sponsors every single news show, I and mean, maybe some of you have seen that clip where they, you know, uh, ABC News, and they're you know, all sponsored by Pfizer, you know, over and over and over. Pfizer, that's probably why the CEO of Pfizer and this is how we sense that they're slipping, said it last week, the people who criticize our product are criminals, you know, and Fauci said, people who criticize me should be brought to, no, it was, a, it was the head of the NIH, people who criticize Fauci should be brought to justice. So I think they're slipping. But the shots came. 
massive propaganda push to get the shots. You remember that. There was a carrot and there was a stick. Hey, come get a shot. We'll give you a beer. We'll give you a donut. Come on down. So we went from we'll give you a beer to you lose your job if you don't get it. And that's the stick. And that's what happened. And then what happened, as we all know, people started dropping dead. It's anecdotal because nobody will look into it. The media, which is sponsored by Pfizer, uh, is completely uninterested in the fact that people are dropping dead. Uh, and this is, again, anecdotal. My wife's own uncle, 58 years old, retired Oakland police officer, in the primest shape you can imagine, martial arts expert. Three days after his second shot, he dropped dead. Heart attack. What? Heart attack? 58, super healthy, no previous conditions. And this, everyone knows someone who's been injured by the vaccine. It may be coincidence, but the media covers it up. There's never a mention of the adverse reaction database, the Ferris database. There's never, you can't, if you talk about it, even though it's on the CDC's own site, you're a conspiracy theorist. But here are a couple of numbers that I looked up um, this morning. 927,738 adverse reactions reported. 19,532 COVID vaccine reported deaths. 99,943 COVID vax reported hospitalizations. And they say that there's only 1% of the actual adverse reactions reported to the database because it's very, very difficult to get these reports. It takes a long time. And doctors are a little stressed because they're all getting fired because they haven't taken the shot, right? So 1%, that would make this the deadliest vaccine in the history of the world if this plays out. And again, maybe it's not true. Maybe it's all coincidence. Why not look into it? Why is everyone completely uninterested in this? The media is silent because it's sponsored by Pfizer. And for all that, the shot doesn't work, guys. It doesn't, and it's not me saying it, it's not Dr. Paul saying it, it's R Rochelle Walensky saying it. Remember when she told Wolf Blitzer in August, she said, yeah, these shots are fantastic. The only thing they can't do is stop infection and it can't stop transmission of the virus. It's like, yeah, this is a fantastic car. The only thing it can't do is go and drive and reverse. <laughs> right? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go for that. They say, well, then they move the goalposts, but it can prevent serious illness and death. Well, this is a virus with a 99.8% recovery rate unless you're in very, very small group of very sick people. So how do they know that? They don't know it. They move the goalpost, and then they say, get your boosters. And that's actually a benefit for us because... If the vaccine doesn't work, why would you get a booster of the same thing? If the vaccine does work, why do you need a booster of the same thing, right? So two weeks of masks to stop the spread, we went from that to being Australia, and Jeff mentioned it, becoming literally a full-on Nazi state. And some of you have seen the videos of these camps. Forget about testing positive for COVID. If you've been in contact with someone who tested positive, the military comes to your door, packs you up like a criminal, and locks you in a little box in a concentration camp. And there's one video where a, a, a woman was begging. She says, I'm, I'm in here. I, I can't move. Can I just please go out and get a little exercise? Said, no, but here's a Valium. Okay, that'll help. Thanks a lot. Austria and Germany, we talk about a little bit. Austria, complete lockdown. Again, it didn't work the first time, so let's do it again. Germany has now said, you must take the vax. Hold still. We're going to put this in your arm, whether you like it or not. And someone else wrote that's far more clever than I am. Hmm, a terrible idea that comes out of Austria is quickly adopted by Germany. <laughs> Where have we heard that before, right? <laughs> and so now we have Omicron. Oh, my gosh, Omicron. It's from Africa, the dark continent, uh, you know. And how did this happen? Why? why? How is this happening? Well, Africa has 7% vaccine rates. Only 7% of Africans are vaccinated. They don't need it. And this, again, may be anecdotal, but they've been taking ivermectin for years because Merck gives it to them for free under a humanitarian deal because they have problems with the, uh, the river fever in their eye, whatever it is, and a lot of other problems. They're not getting it. They don't have COVID deaths there, but they also don't have the vaccine. This is dangerous. That's a big control group. And as we saw with the people in the Pfizer study, you've got to kill the control group. Kill meaning you've got to, you've got to shoot it in them. You've got to shoot it in them. You know, maybe this is a conspiracy theory. I don't know. But Dr. Paul and I did a show about this. What's going on in Africa? No one's getting sick and no one's getting the jab. 
And all of a sudden, guess what? Oh my gosh, here's a new virus out of Africa. First of all, we gotta lock them in and treat them as if they're second class citizens. They can't go anywhere else. Well, a couple of people from South Africa got on a plane and went to uh, the Netherlands. They had to be either fully vaccinated, I think that's about 12 boosters now, and they had to take a test just before they got on the plane. So everyone was completely airtight, clean, no virus anywhere. They landed in, in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. 65 of them had gotten COVID positive when they landed. So how did that happen? I don't know. Lies. Lies is what we're talking about. A recent article in the Evening Standard, which is a UK newspaper, uh, they interviewed a vascular surgeon and a psychologist. The vascular surgeon was Dr. Hussein. He said, I'm seeing a big increase in thrombolic-related vascular conditions in my practice. I really don't know what that means, but it really doesn't sound very good. Even younger patients are being admitted and requiring surgical and medical intervention. This is more than prior to the pandemic. We could see 300,000 new patients with heart issues in the near future. Now, even the UK is very, very highly vaccinated. They're shooting it into the kids as fast as they've seen. And all of a sudden, kids are coming in. Kids, healthy kids, are coming in with heart, big heart problems. And so here's a doctor saying, we've got something going on here. Well, they turn to the psychologist. And here's what he says. This is all due to something called post-pandemic stress disorder. Post, this is it. He said, this is a condition that has yet to be recognized, though many experts think it should be, okay? Kids are dropping like flies. The only thing that's different is that they've been locked down for a year, okay, that might have something to do with it, or that they get the stuff shot in their arm, and it's not because the stuff shot in their arm is not any good, or that being locked down is not awfully good for your mental and physical health. No, they're just having stress disorder. Have a Valium, right? So you might ask yourself now that I'm reaching the last part of my talk. How is all of this related to the Ron Paul doctrine? This is not what I paid for. I don't want to be lectured to for an, half an hour about this. Well, the last two years, indeed, the last 20 years have been, again, a mountain of lies. They attacked us because we're free. Saddam has WMDs. Gaddafi's handing out Viagra, right? Trump colluded with Russia. The vax will set you free. A mountain of lies building up and, and, and certainly concentrated and intensified over this last two years. And we've been buried under this avalanche of lies by both parties. So what is the Ron Paul doctrine? It's simple. At its core, it's about telling the truth. Truth. And truth defeats lies. You know, spoiler alert, the father of lies is defeated in the end, right? Um, it's simple. It's about telling the truth, the Giuliani moment, right? Experts would have called it the worst political blunder in history. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine all the consultants? Don't say that. We have rehearsed 28 things for you to say, and that is not one of them, okay? Don't tell the truth. Whatever you do, you'll never get elected. You'll never, you'll never you know, amount to anything in politics. My personal favorite, I love the Giuliani moment, though I admit I was also very nervous when I watched it. Um, my favorite one is when they tried to trump uh, uh, Dr. Paul. They tried to trick him, as they always did. Okay, President Paul, you're sitting there at three in the morning. The phone rings, and it's Castro on the line. What do you, what do you say to him? And <laughs> Dr. Paul says, why are you calling? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> So the Ron Paul Doctrine, cut down to its, to its core, is to tell the truth. Tell the truth. The golden rule applies to us and to governments. It applies across society, to our domestic policy, to our foreign policy. A moral society is at its core a just society. And as Dr. Paul always says, the political leaders will follow the, the moral composition of, of the people who elect them. And so if, if, we, if we allow ourselves to become an immoral, untruthful society, if we accept what's happening to us without a fight, then we will have leaders that will be sure to, to, keep, to keep up the heat. So so it looks, it looks dark for us right now. 
I mean, and I admit I've been to some dark places this past couple of years. It feels like, it's, it's like I said last night, it's like we're fighting the Hydra. We get one victory and two, two new heads pop out. You know, we, we debunk one thing and two, two more lies come in its place. It feels very, very dark. But I would say this is our moment of greatest opportunity. Right now is the moment for all of us who believe in liberty and peace this is our greatest opportunity, I think, that we'll have in a lifetime because the failure of everyone else is laid bare before us on all sides, total and absolute failure. Yesterday, I think it was, 80 Republicans voted, Republicans voted to expand the CDC and create a federal vaccine a database to know who's vaxxed and who's not. 80 Republicans both sides, both parties, all the rest of them, the media, all the liars have failed and they've created a hell on earth. We have an obligation, we have a responsibility, but we also have a great opportunity now to plant the seeds of liberty, plant the seeds of freedom, plant the seeds of peace, to, to expand the message, to grow the message, and to spread each and every one of us, we are all ambassadors of the Ron Paul Doctrine. And it's so simple, just tell the truth. Thank you.